Well, hello. Here we are in pre-show mode. Welcome to this live stream on the 7th of July 2020. Martin North here, of course, and uh, just watching the chat. Quite a few people on already. Just got over 220. And uh, I'm just going to put my pre-show banner on for a few moments just to uh, make it clear that that's what we're doing. We'll give people another moment or two. Good evening, Michael, um, Maria, Jared. A lot of other people on with quite a few of the old names as well. Reverse French, good to see you again. Um, and uh, some new ones too. So it's always great to see you all coming on to spend some time with me tonight. And we've got a packed show ahead. Um, not only have I got uh, updated mortgage stress and rental stress, but I am also looking at the question of investor stress. And uh, Ron, I'll make a note of 2710 to add it to my list. I did have a piece of paper here, I've lost it. Hang on. Grab it from the bin. It's always a good place to get it, isn't it? <laughs> 2710. There you go. It's on the list. I think I did it last time too, Ron, but it will have changed anyway, so we'll do it this time. Yeah. So it's very cold here tonight, actually, uh, and we've got rain now. We had a lovely bright day, but it's pretty off now. So I'm just going to run this for a moment or two longer. And then I'm going to get started with the formal show. And uh, we've just got nearly 300 on the stream now, which is good. And uh, hopefully a few more will come on shortly as well. So that's uh, pretty excellent. And... Uh, got a lot to go through tonight. A lot of the information is quite new and I think that'll be quite interesting as well. Okay, well um, people are throwing postcodes at me already so <laughs> I know I should be doing it a bit later on. Anyway, I'm now going to take the pre-show off. Oops, pushed it twice. Always a mistake to push it twice. There you go. And uh, what I'm now going to do is to run the intro and then we'll get started formally. So here we go. Good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 7th of July 2020. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on board for another in our weekly series of live shows. Today we're going to be looking in great detail at mortgage stress, rental stress and also investor stress. First time actually on investor stress, a whole bunch of additional information that we've been running through our models. So that'll be exciting. Great to see everybody on so far. Lots of uh, old names and some new names too. Welcome to you all. I haven't got time to acknowledge everybody now because otherwise we'll be doing nothing but that all evening. But um, great to see everybody on the stream tonight. And uh, what I want to do just initially is uh, just um, quickly go through the running order for tonight. Uh, which is pretty straightforward. Um, introduction, done that. House rules, just to say, um, uh, you know, it's important. There are just a few things that we need to say each time just so that everyone's on the same page. Talk about our models, go through a few key slides, including our mortgage stress slides, and then there'll be questions and answers. And uh, we'll sign off after that. Typically, this runs for about an hour and a half. Come, you know, come. Maybe longer, maybe shorter, depending on how we go. And if we're going to deep postcodes, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, so just in terms of uh, house rules, um, please understand this isn't financial advice. I have to say this every time. I'm, I'm not qualified to give financial advice. Um, this is just my own analysis, my own opinion. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, if you need somebody to help you, guide you, go talk to them. You probably have to pay a fee but they will be able to tailor advice to your particular circumstances. I can't do that here. So this isn't financial advice, just a general chat. Also, please play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. Plexus is doing a great job in terms of just uh, keeping things under control. And if we do get uh, you know, some trouble, we'll uh, clean it up very quickly. So I appreciate Plexus's help once again. Tremendous uh, for um, just keeping the channel clean and clear. And uh, this is as of the 7th of July 2020. I'm sure... Uh, 
this if you follow this in playback months years later things will be very different but this is as at now and in fact the data that i'm presenting shortly is as at today as well because the information came in this morning please use that walk the world if you want to get my attention on the chat there are always lots of conversations i can't necessarily engage around all of them but if you do use that walk the world there's a greater chance that i can uh, see it and act and respond appropriately we also do have Super Chat enabled, so if you would like to make a contribution to the channel, that's one way of doing it. And indeed, if you want to make sure that your question goes to the top of the list and gets noticed, you can use Super Chat, so that uh, is another way of getting my attention. Just want to say that uh, for those new on the channel, um, I use my own custom methods and approaches in my analysis, and it's all based around my core market model. And the point about the core market model is that it is essentially um, pulling information from our household surveys. We run those continually through the year, 52,000 in the model at any one time, 4,500 each month, 1,000 a week. The latest came in today. So it's right up to date. We also do the same for the business sector. And we also pull information from other sources, including all the public sources. We then put that through our market model. And that then leads us into a sort of set of activities, including supporting our YouTube channel with the data, doing work for clients, writing reports, and a bunch of other things too. But the point I want to underscore is this is not just based on opinion. It's based on data. And personally, I think that uh, data is a really good place to s sort of spend time on because it really does get beyond some of the speculation and some of the rubbish that people out there in uh, property land often speak. We also have the ability to um, slice and dice the data lots of different ways. So, for example, we can cut it by property status. We can cut it by geographic locators we can segment it through different uh, segments through our master algorithms and that means that we can start identifying different types of people and what they're up to as well and that becomes very important when it comes to all the things that are going on at the moment now just on the reserve bank because they published their uh, comment very brief comment today that didn't change the rate of course so the policy rate is precisely the same at 0.25% uh, and indeed uh, the three-year Aussie government bonds at 25 basis points too. So that really signals long-term rates being very much uh, very much the same. Uh, for a long time, you know, they're saying I think it's going to be three to five years before things change. So the second point is they're talking about the severe downturn around the world and I think that's uh, pretty clear now. Everybody is recognizing that. The question is how severe is it? They also spoke about the fact that financial markets have improved, volatility has declined, and that's one of the interesting points. They've thrown so much money, the central banks, at the financial system that the volatility has um, gone back uh, into more normal levels. But, of course, the value of assets is shooting very high relative to the real economy, so you could argue that the markets are disconnected from reality, and that always suggests it could uh, collapse later. Now, in Australia, um, the uh, Reserve Bank has essentially um, done very little since its first bond purchases. They've purchased 50 billion. Um, they are prepared to scale up the bond purchases again, and they say we'll do whatever's necessary um, to target the rate if it's required, but at the moment it looks as though it's relatively tame. So that's um, quite an interesting observation. They also said that um, financial services uh, organisations were drawing from the liquidity facility. That's one of the things they put in place. Um, so the central bank is effectively supporting the financial system directly. Um, they also made the point that there was a very significant rise in unemployment. 800,000 people lost their jobs. And remember that that's really a very uh, understated view of the situation because there are many, many more on JobKeeper, about probably two and a half million people on JobKeeper. So the real situation is a lot more dire than that 800,000. Of course, the unemployment rate is a lot higher in reality compared with the 7.1% that's being quoted by the ABS. We did a show on that quite recently. Go and have a look at that if you want to get more information about that. Uh, they also made the point there was a bit of a pickup in retail spending. Of course, this was pre-COVID Mark II. Um, so the question is, will the Victorian um, events over the last few days change that ahead? Probably it will. 
They also made the point that uh, many households and businesses remain cautious. And, uh, you know, that level of confidence and the lack of it potentially is, I think, a very big deal. There was more data out today that suggested that uh, retail confidence, sorry, consumer confidence had actually gone backwards. Um, and that's partly, I think, to do with the Melbourne situation. And they also made the point that it's likely that fiscal and monetary support will be required for some long time. Well, nothing new there. They keep saying that. And they also say that they will do whatever it takes in terms of maintaining that strategy into the, uh, you know, long term and really will do nothing on rates until the employment rate comes way back. And so the question is unemployment. It's going to probably stay very low for, sorry, unemployment's going to stay very high for, for a long period of time. It will probably be a long, long time before it comes back to the lows where it was before the COVID. Now, just a couple of other points. Uh, you may or may not have picked up the fact that uh, the um, uh, lockdown in Melbourne is back for six weeks. There were 191 cases today. You can see there on the left of the chart the uh, very big steep line up. That, of course, is uh, Victoria, gone very high. Um, the other states, less so. There's a little bit of an uptick in New South Wales, but nothing like as much as it was. And um, unfortunately, I think it's going to take a long time to get this under control. And so expect uh, more lockdowns and more um, difficulty ahead. And, uh, you know, it is unfortunate, but many businesses will have to close again. It means that a lot of the SMEs who are thinking of reopening and being able to actually drive their business forward won't now. So that's a big deal. Uh, also, it's just worth highlighting this. This came out from the Fin Review today that they there are a few areas where the government support got thrown to businesses and consumers, but of course there's a question as to whether it will actually be quite that same. So for example, uh, the Fin Review said that uh, family businesses might actually find that they get a bill from the tax man for some of the loans that they got to help them through. Uh, we also know that the um, ATO is also looking quite hard at some of the superannuation uh, payments that were made uh, urgently. Uh, and of course the uh, latest from APRA shows that the Payments now is about 19 billion in total. That's, you know, bearing in mind that people could get um, a first tranche one side of the financial year end and the next tranche the second year. And if you've got um, a couple, you know, you can accumulate 40K in total. So, um, But the ATR will be reviewing and perhaps even wanting to claim back some of those payments. So it's not necessarily a, a, a free ride. Um, a lot of the superannuation funds are quite concerned by this continued leakage of course and uh, I expect to see it continuing for some time yet and by the way from my surveys quite a few people who've grabbed superannuation probably can't really justify it in terms of uh, impact of COVID so it'll be interesting to see what the ATO does. Um, CoreLogic just made the point that property prices um, down again this is the day's in today's index and uh, you know apart from Brisbane and the Gold Coast went up very slightly, but all the others are down. Perth, of course, is now down nearly 22% from its peaks. And um, unfortunately, um, the Western Australian property market is, look, I think, in, looks going to slide further, despite the fact that there are incentives in Western Australia, particularly around the um, land package um, processes. And you may have picked up from one of my earlier comments that a couple of months ago there was around, let's say, 200 packages sold in a month. Last month it was 1,600 packages thanks to all the stimulus packages. So people rushed in and in fact the price of land went up thanks to the supply demand disequilibrium. So these um, incentive schemes, frankly, are a bit of a waste of space in my view. It's a net sum game. Now, in terms of mortgage and rental stress, um, as normal, um, should explain, this is based on cash flow. So money in, money out. And in terms of money in, we think of income, we think of pensions, interest, dividends, all other sources. And in terms of money out, we think of all the various expenditures that households have. And we build eff effectively for each of our survey respondents a mini balance sheet and P&L that says what's coming in, what's going out. And the reason I do it like that is because it's really then trying to understand um, what is looking, what it's looking like from a cash flow perspective, despite the fact that some may well have other assets. You know, they might um, um, have investments or assets. But if it's um, on a cash flow basis, more going out than coming in, close to zero, then we put them in stress. If they're severely underwater, we put them in severe stress, and that's the way we do it. Um, others will use 30% of income on mortgage repayments. 
but frankly that is just impossibly difficult it doesn't really tell you very much this is a much more accurate way of getting where things are so that's why we do it like that and um, in terms of mitigations people can do various things like cutting back on spending drawing down deposits putting more on credit cards and even reaching for other credit you know um, buy now pay later payday loans all those things and that's one of the reasons why afterpay is doing very well at the moment um, relative in fact to the debit to, uh, to the credit um, balances on credit cards which are actually going down quite fast at the moment and um, you know the point is that mortgage stress is an early indicator of trouble ahead and I keep using Mandra as my case study Western Australian mortgage stress at Mandra went very high a few years ago and that then flowed through into falling house prices higher levels of default higher levels of negative equity and particularly probably investors getting um, caught as well and in fact in Western Australia in Mandra prices are 38% down 38% from their peak back in 2006 so don't think that prices can only ever go up they can also go down as well now when it comes to mortgage stress this is the latest information so this is as at um, the end of June and in fact incorporate some information for the last few days because effectively I updated the information on Tuesday and uh, the point to make here is that mortgage stress mortgage stress is now at 39.1 percent of households now that's up from 37 and a half percent last month and that means that one, more than 1.47 million households are struggling with cash flow issues at the moment across the country and to try and understand that it's worth asking the question well what's changed well the first is we are seeing more what I call structural unemployment so structural unemployment is um, effectively um, the fact of people struggling um, with job loss but not casual job loss not part-time job loss these are corporate jobs that are going so for example from the um, uh, consulting sector um, airlines you know so we're seeing more structural unemployment and that means that more people are getting hit the trouble is with those is they were on bigger incomes so effectively their um, incomes would not be replaced by job keeper or a job seeker and that's creating a huge financial pressure for quite a few people at the moment and um, unfortunately my expectation is that more businesses will indeed right size in other words lay people off uh, until until they can be more confident of what's happening uh, later on and um, you know that's quite a big deal really in terms of uh, what's going on also we've got job keeper you've got some returning workers particularly for some uh, uh, sort of uh, retail areas and some restaurants and cafes those sorts of places like that um, there's also of course the bank postponement mechanisms for some mortgage holders uh, not a huge number but quite a few have have taken advantage of that there are certain rules and regulations around that that I have to um, be able to prove and there are many investors property investors who've actually not been able to uh, avail themselves of that particular facility there's also of course some refinancing to lower rates and also switching to interest only and APRA has said quite recently they're very comfortable and assets confirmed very comfortable for people on existing mortgages to switch to interest only mortgages if that helps um, trouble is of course there that two or three years ago after the Royal Commission uh, everyone was complaining about the fact that interest only loans were a real problem because the capital still has to be repaid later so it's rather gone on you know the other direction at the moment so that's the overall mortgage stress story now what we can then do is we can actually drill down a little bit further and um, um, just go to there first and here is now the state information first um, I haven't done charts this time because I had people last time said I'd love to see the real numbers so I've done real numbers so I hope you uh, can read them um, and it's worth saying that um, if, you, if you go over to the um, side of the chart you can see here that uh, we've got average in stress down the side here 39.1 percent and then over here we've actually got each of the states um, so if I go back to there you can see that in fact Tasmania is at 49.4 percent of households in mortgage stress so they have the highest proportion in in the country at the moment and um, not a vast number 
Um, so there's essentially around 40,000 households in Tasmania of the 85,000 who are borrowing there. And then we go to the Northern Territory, it's a very small number of course because it's a relatively small uh, territory. And then you go to Victoria. So Victoria has 41.8% uh, mortgage stress, and that's quite a bit higher than previously. That's 406,000 households in degrees of difficulty, and um, it's also worth making the point that there are some there risking default. Not a vast number, but 25,000 risking default in Victoria, compared with 18,000 in Queensland and 26,000 in New South Wales. And in fact, as you go down the list, you can see that New South Wales actually has the lowest level of mortgage stress at 36.2%, but that's still um, 408,000 households in difficulty. And uh, you can see there that the biggest losses are likely to come from New South Wales. But I want to highlight again, Victoria is to my mind, one of the most critical areas to look at because the default rate is actually as high in Victoria as in South Australia. And, um, you know, WA is 4.7, so that's actually a lot higher, but that's been running for a long, long time. So there's a bit more stress, a bit more pain and higher defaults in Victoria. Now, of course, locked down. Now, we can also look at this by our segments as well. And uh, again, it's sorted the same sort of way with the percentage in stress. 39.1% is the average. Young growing families, including many first-time buyers, are the most stressed, 69.2%. And then we've got some uh, battling urban and disadvantaged fringe households. Um, and then we go into our mature, stable and suburban mainstream. But we've also got exclusive professionals and um, even young affluent households. They are the more affluent uh, part of the, of the market and they have issues too. And note that the exclusive professionals has the largest risk of loss because they're highly leveraged, they've got very large properties, they've got very large mortgages, often multiple mortgages. And so quite a lot of the risk in the system are actually at the um, top end of the market there. And what's one of the things that many of the lenders, I don't think, fully recognise, that the risk profiles are much more tilted towards the more affluent households. But I'm also concerned about some of these first-time buyers because we're seeing quite a few first-time buyers who bought in relatively recently within the last couple of years getting into trouble. And unfortunately, quite a few of them are actually experiencing now unemployment or loss of hours and inability to service the mortgages. Now, we can also look at the data a different way too, and this is basically across the regions. And um, the point about the regional analysis is not to go into it in massive amounts of detail. It's just, um, you know, too much on the page. But I want to highlight the fact, and of course there's a couple of anomalies. We've got very low numbers, like 225 households uh, in the New South Wales part of the Canberra uh, area. Um, those numbers don't mean much, so ignore that. But if you look at some of the others, you can see there that we've got big representations in places like Sydney, for example, and, um, you know, quite a few in Brisbane and Moreton Bay. But you've also got quite high levels of stress in other regional areas too. And one of the things that I, that I want to highlight is that mortgage stress is not just in the main centres, it's also in the regional areas as well. And this is just the rest of it. So you can see there, Adelaide's got 220,000, 102. Um, and the whole point about this is um, that you know, there are large pockets of mortgage stress in places beyond the urban centres. Now, the top stress postcodes nationally, this is just the start of the list, um, maybe not too much surprised in a way. Ballarat is right at the top there um, with a total in stress of 6,994 households. And then we go across to uh, 6 030, that includes places like uh, Clarkson and Meriwa and Queen's Rock and Tamala Park, and that's 6,950. Now, I've flagged that as young growing families because a lot of those are new um, purchases, uh, buying on those new estates on the outskirts of, uh, of Perth, north of the um, north of the and south of the, uh, the the main CBD. Then we go across to Melbourne with places like Sydenham, uh, 3037. 
and then we go to Cranbourne and Cranbourne South. I wanted to call out we've got quite a few wealthy seniors and older households in those postcodes as well as younger rank families. Quite a few of them are now in difficulty as well because their incomes have been crimped not least because of the income from deposits, which is almost non-existent now. And then we go to Point Cook and Werribee, 3030, another Melbourne one. Then we go to Melbourne, 3810, Pakenham and Pakenham Upper. Young growing families again, another 6,000 there. Hopper's Crossing in Melbourne. You can spot the common themes, Melbourne, 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 Melbourne. And that's the point I want to make, that we're actually seeing high levels of stress in our top postcodes in a number of Melbourne postcodes. So again, my belief is that we've got a lot of difficulty in and around Melbourne. Then we go across to um, uh, the west there at Stirling, um, in places like Ellenbrook and Upper Swan. Then we come back to Sydney, into Sydney, and like um, uh, Harrington Park, Mount Annan, places like that, Narrow Vale. And um, Central Tablelands, places like that. And then Mackay, uh, and Mackay, of course, includes um, quite a few uh, little towns and uh, quite a few big towns as well. It's a large area, but more than 5,000 there up in Queensland. Then we go to Adelaide, um, 5108, and that's the areas around Salisbury. And then we go to, back to Melbourne to Craigie Burn and Donnybrook and Roxburgh Park. That's 3064. And then we go to Brisbane, Morton Bay. And then we go back to Sydney. And on it goes. So the point I want to make is that there is a significant range of postcodes that are actually stressed. But one, the numbers are rising. And two, there's a consistent pattern in the types of households who are actually uh, being recorded as stressed in these large numbers. A lot of them are out of out of towns, urban fringe type developments, modern developments. Quite a few of them actually are with people with higher levels of income and bigger mortgages because they're highly leveraged and then suddenly their incomes have disappeared. So that's what I'm seeing at the moment. Now, if we can quickly go through to rental stress. Now, rental stress is looking at uh, cash flow, but when paying rent rather than with a mortgage. And there, 1.78 million households are in rental stress at the moment. And that is 39.4% of all renting households and you can see there that it varies a little bit but Tasmania again at 56.3 percent has the largest amount of proportionally speaking rental stress and then we go to Victoria at 40.5 percent with 471,000 then some in South Australia Western Australia 38.2 percent 38.2 percent in the Northern Territory too ACT at 38.1 New South Wales at 37.9%, but with 726,000 in rental stress there. And 36.8% in Queensland with 318,000 there. Now, this is a very big deal because many people, of course, are struggling. Um, in some cases, they've had rental repayment holidays, but some haven't. And in some cases, they've tried to negotiate with their landlords unsuccessfully. So that's all part of that picture. Now, in terms of by segments, um, and again, it's the same segments as last time. So you can see there that, uh, you know, there's a range. Young growing families, yep, again, 122,000 of them are stressed, um, largest. And then we go to the disadvantaged fringe and the battling urban. That's the same sort of uh, scenarios that we saw with rental, uh, with mortgage stress. And then we go to other areas like the exclusive professionals. And then the young affluents are the least stressed but there's still 173,000 of them um, with difficulty. And you can see that the largest group, and this is a bit different from mortgage stress, the largest group is the suburban mainstream. So these are people, more mature families. You know, they'll have um, you know, kids at home, kids at school, whatever. Um, a lot of them are also struggling too. So this is, again, quite widespread. And we can also look at it by top postcodes. Same sort of idea as previously, but note that Melbourne, 3,000, um, has the largest count of rental stress, 13,714. Now, that's explained by uh, students who are there uh, and not earning 
perhaps the part-time work that they were, and a lot of them live in, in and around the centre of, of Melbourne. It's also explained by the fact that many people living in that in rented property in that central area are paying big rents because they've um, traditionally had to do that. And uh, some of them are now running out of smoke when it comes to making those rental repayments. And then we go to 2560, which includes the area around Campbelltown. There's 9,000 there. And then we go across to Liverpool, 2170, with 8,800 there. And then we go to 2770, which is another New South Wales postcode, and uh, another 8,700 there. And then we go to 2540, and again, a long list of uh, different locations like St George's Base and Sussex Inlet, a few other areas, 8,600. Then we go up to um, the area around Toowoomba, 4350, with 55.7% uh, of renters in that area stressed, 8,415. And then we go back to New South Wales. And then we continue in New South Wales around Gosford, so the central coast, 2250, with another 7,789. And so it goes on. Um, 3030, which is uh, Durham, Point Cook and Werribee again, 7,181 in mortgage stress, 31 in rental stress, 31.7%. And so it goes on. Um, there is some cor correlations between rental stress and mortgage stress in some postcodes, but there's also some quite big differences, like 3,000, very strongly stressed when it comes to rental stress. Okay, now let's go to property investor stress. Now, this is new work that I've been doing, and it's quite complicated, right? Because the first thing, in particular geographies, you'll have properties for rent. And roughly, there's about 3.2 million properties for rent across the country, give or take. And many of those will be individuals, but they could also be owned by firms as well. Now, you also have got a number of rental property owners. But the rental property owners don't necessarily live in the same place as the rental properties. right? So you might, for example, be living in postcode 3000, but actually you have rental properties in 3010 or something like that. Um, so... We are representing this both ways, right? From the renting perspective, we know what the rental stress is. Here, we're talking about the property owners in a particular area, postcode or geographic area. And then we can identify what proportion of those are stressed. Now, here we have to use a few different mechanisms. We can't just use some um, cash flow directly, although that's part of it. So we've included things like, was the property vacant? Um, is it... Um, uh, in negative cash flow in terms of money in, money out to service the mortgage. Um, are they trying to get rid of the property? All those things are in, are in the mix to be able to identify whether they're actually stressed. We also identify which are severe stress. So this is a subset of the uh, stressed investors. And you can see there that of the um, 2,875,000 2, rental property owners, there are around 833,000 who are stressed, and that's about a quarter, 25.9%. And you can see it varies quite considerably by different postcodes uh, and different states. So in um, the New South Wales area, it's 35%. That's actually the highest proportion um, of uh, stressed investors. Um, they, that's Again, let me be clear, that's where they live. That isn't necessarily where they have their property. So they might be, for example, living in New South Wales, renting in the West, for example. But that's important because if those decide to essentially sell up or try and get rid of the property, right, it puts pressure on the postcode where they're living as well as the postcode where they're trying to sell. Okay, so that's that part. Now, the next thing then is to look at um, this across our segments, and what you can see immediately is that there are some quite different proportions. The most significantly stressed group from an investment perspective are young affluent investors. And that's 55.6, so more than half of young affluents. And in fact, 49.3% of exclusive professionals, so the more affluent end of the investor property set, are the ones who are actually struggling with cash flow. 
Not surprisingly, if you think about it, because they tend to have multiple properties, they tend to have bigger properties, they have, tend to have bigger mortgages, and uh, in many cases they now find them vacant. And um, we can also then go down the list, and you can see there that um, young growing families are, you know, around 26, and um, the disadvantaged fringe are somewhat low as well. And there's a relatively um, large number of those who are financially less sophisticated. You know, I would say most people in these disadvantaged fringe area probably would be in the battling urban less sophisticated, uh, but quite a few of them have got investment properties. And the question is, do they really understand what they're into in terms of their investment properties? Um, the fact of the matter is that um, it's actually quite complicated to really get to the heart of what's driving them. But I can tell you that many of those, many of the disadvantaged fringe and the suburban uh, and the battling urban are actually very inexperienced and their net rental yields are actually much lower than the exclusive professionals and the young affluents. But even the young affluents and the exclusive professionals, you know, at 49.3 and 55.6% are indeed struggling. And this is, I think, a big deal. Now, we can also then look at where, and this is actually by um, suburbs and postcodes. And you can see here that it's actually postcode 2010, which is Surrey Hills, where the um, number of stressed investors is largest, 4,260. And um, that's a big deal. That's 79% of property investors in that postcode struggling. I think that's pretty stunning. Now, of course, some of them will be renting uh, property in and around the same area, others differently. Then we can look at the next one, which is 2,000, so New South Wales CBD. And there, 80% of investors are stressed, but there's a small account. Um, so that's 3,500. And then we can go to the inner suburbs like Randwick. And then we go to postcode 3000, Victoria, Melbourne. So guess what? In the top four or five, you've got Victoria again, 3000. 3000 was the very same place where we had the highest levels of mortgage stress and the high levels of rental stress. There are huge issues in the property market in and around Victoria, Melbourne, CBD, in my view. And we can go down the list a bit further, South Yarra, St Kilda. Um, then we come back to New South Wales, Rushcutters Bay, and then we go to Newtown. They're in the inner suburbs. And the point I want to make is a lot of these postcodes are in the inner suburbs or close to the CBD. And it tells you that some of the more affluent people, those who actually have quite a portfolio of properties often, uh, are actually quite often in difficulty. Okay, last thing to talk about before I come back to the Q&A is the scenario. So I've updated my scenarios once again and I've taken account of all the information up till uh, early this evening. And uh, of course scenarios are just a way of considering the futures. It's not saying it's a prediction of exactly what's going to happen, but it gives you a relative feeling based on my modelling. It comes out the back of the core market model as I just showed you. And so Basically, in my RBA baseline scenario, this is essentially if everything went as the RBA thought it would, there is still a trajectory possibility over the next couple of years of a small house price rise, maybe 5%. But there's equally, I think, a chance of a small fall. And I give that now a 10% weighting. I gave it a 20% weighting last time, but now COVID is back. And I'm taking account of that and some of the other data that I'm seeing in my modelling. As a result of that, my best case... Um, as I call it. In other words, this is what I think is what could happen if things went really, really well. Um, very low, low cash rate. Um, unemployment rate 7.5% in a couple of years' time. Mortgage stress at 40% and prices between 5 and 15%. And this is basically baseline now. So there's a further drop, a few percentage points. And I've given that now a 20% weighting. There's a longer term crunch scenario where effectively things get um, you know, longer, uh, down for longer, higher unemployment rate, um, higher losses, some more significant home price falls. And that's now got a 40 percent weighting. And the second wave, this is the one I've had to update um, a little bit because of what's happened with uh, Victoria, because my own view is it's quite likely that we're going to see second wave outbreaks elsewhere too. I think it's quite unlikely they're going to be able to actually trap the virus. So in that scenario, you've got um, very low rates, you've got much higher levels of unemployment, and you've got uh, more home price falls. That's now got a 25% weight 
compared with 20% last time. And then the last one is the uncontrolled pandemic where effectively the whole thing just blows up. I give that a 5% weighting. I mean, if we, if we go down the track of the US, for example, um, the, you know, this could be really, really serious, but I don't give it much weight. Um, I think that it's somewhere in these first couple we're going to see where we are. And it goes back to to what extent um, the virus will get under control, to what extent that will uh, res be responded to in terms of physical stimulus. And uh, I'm expecting significant extension to JobKeeper and uh, changes to uh, job seeker to provide more support for more households and businesses into the uh, next 12 to 18 months. Because they, if they turned it off in September, then we are probably looking uh, in these scenarios, second wave disruption and worse. Um, whereas if you do more fiscal, you might get away with a little less. So there you go. That's pretty much um, my scenarios. And I'm now going to um, uh, come back to the uh, Q&A and uh, just to give you a little bit of a view of this is the uh, studio from another angle. See, I've got it um, live tonight. I normally put this in the overlay for um, uh, the uh, uh, just edited version, but I thought you might be interested in just to see me here doing my thing. Um, and this is how it's all set up. So there you go. Um, I might come back once more um, later on. Now let's have a look at some of the questions. Um, OK, now... I'm not going to start answering specific questions on postcodes yet because once I get into postcode land, we're never going to get out of it. So I'm just going to have a quick look down and see um, what some of the questions are. Um, <laughs> I love this one. I've put this one up. If it comes up, there you go. This is from AI. Martin's predictions keep changing. He always wrong. Enough with predictions. Just report what's happening. No, 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 no. You don't understand. These are not predictions. These are scenarios. There's a fundamental difference between predictions and scenarios. Scenarios give you a sense of how I think things could play out and the relative weighting. You have to be more sophisticated to understand what I'm actually doing. It is not just a prediction. And I, you know, I'm misreported all the time based on, on, on what I say. Um, these are scenarios. This is just giving you a relative weighting. And I've shown that there is an opportunity for prices to rise. There's an opportunity for prices to fall. It's somewhere in between. But at least you can get a bit of a sense of the relative weighting. And it's mathematically driven off the models. So, yeah, I'm afraid that that's um, a bit off AI. I, I don't agree with your comments there. All right. OK. Now, what else have we got here? Uh, 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 uh. OK. Um, <laughs> lots of cross chat auditing the Fed. Yeah, it's probably could be done. I'm not sure who's going to audit the Fed. The Fed's, uh, um, by the way, I'm not sure that Fed is actually supporting capitalism, but that's another story. You might have seen my post the other day that I uh, went into that in some detail. Okay, let's have a look. What else have we got? Um, OK, I'm going to pick up one of the questions that I had in beforehand because I think it's actually quite a good one. I'll do it now. Um, so Pete asked, can you make some comparisons between um, 2000 and 3000? You know, there's the, the CBDs of Sydney and Melbourne because he's trying to understand a bit more about the two. So here is the, um, the uh, postcode database and I preloaded Melbourne and Sydney. And this gives me the opportunity of showing you how the database works now. So basically for each postcode, I have the number of estimated households in the postcode. I have the proportion who are borrowing, the proportion who are renting, the number of properties for rent in the postcode, the number of rental property owners. And it's interesting if you sort of compare the two, you can quite often see that there are multiple property owners. Remember those rental property owners don't necessarily coincide with the rental properties in that postcode. Remember, I'm looking at it from a different lens. Then the number who with mild mortgage stress, the number with severe stress, the percentage in mortgage stress, the risk of default over the next 12 months, in other words, how many will fall over, um, the percentage default in 12 months, then the number in rental stress, the percentage in rental stress, and then the number of stressed investors in the postcode. Again, remember, this is nothing to do with where the investment property is. It's to do where the investor is and how many of them are severely stressed and what percentage of investors are stressed. So that's how the model works. And you can see there's some quite interesting differences between Millers Point and 2000 and Melbourne 3000. So one, there are more households in the centre of Melbourne than, than in the centre of Sydney. 
There are more borrowing households in Melbourne than Sydney, and there are significantly more renters, 18,000 compared with 10,000. And there are also more properties for rent, 13,000 compared with 8,000. And the number of rental property owners there are actually roughly similar. So a similar number of people live close in and own, rental pro and, and own investment properties. Now, the mild mortgage stress is slightly higher in Sydney relative to Melbourne. And as a result of that, the percentage of mortgage stress is 8% for Melbourne 3000 and 27.3% for Millers Point. And the risk of default, though, is a little high in Melbourne. That's because I'm seeing more stress and strains in the system. And the default risk is 2.2% compared with 1.7% in Sydney. The rental stress, though, is 13,700 in Melbourne relative to 6,500 in Sydney. And that translates to 74.3% relative to 59.6%. So you can see there that Victoria has significantly higher rental stress and therefore um, it's perhaps not too surprising that we're also seeing that stressed investors, you know, around 3,000 3, in each, um, severe stress, slightly more in Sydney than in Melbourne, but the percentage of investors, 70% in CBD of Melbourne and 80% in the CBD of Sydney. So there you go. That was Pete's uh, question. I hope that helped, Pete. And um, you can see that there's some interesting correlations and comparisons between the two. Okay, what else have we got? Um, <laughs> that's a very good question. If I can get that up on the screen, I will. So uh, Maria asked, do you regret your 60 minutes interview? Do you think you were wrong back then or just delayed? Well, no. What happened was they mis... Not misreported, but I gave them my scenarios, right, as I do every time. But they only picked the worst, worst example. And, I, and then basically I said, well, if everything goes terribly wrong, that's what could happen, right? And I still say, if everything goes terribly wrong, that could certainly happen. It's not my only scenario. It's only ever been one of a number of scenarios. And yet, of course, they wanted the, um, the headline. So, and if you remember the Media Watch review that happened at the time, uh, I actually um, made the point in that, that essentially I think they should have presented a range of scenarios rather than just the one. But of course, they wanted to go for the headline. So no, I don't regret it. And it did at least get the whole issue on the table of the risk of uh, mortgage um, slides and uh, you know fr frankly prices fall big mortgages you got issues and of course I always said the critical issue was going to be what would happen to the uh, unemployment rate because unemployment is the key here right if unemployment comes back to a, a low number quickly then we're fine we're free and hose and can carry on but the more that I see the data and the more that I look at um, what's happening in Melbourne and those things, the more I'm convinced that unemployment will actually be lower or higher for longer. In other words, less jobs, less work hours and uh, more people struggling with uh, partial employment from all sorts of different areas. So I think it's a big deal. OK, and um, here's one. We'll just talk about that. Where do you see the Aussie dollar going? <laughs> yeah, good question there. It's just nearly, nearly back up to 70 now, right? Um, it's a question of what happens to the US dollar, right? Because the US dollar essentially is, is, is you know, where it's all at. My own view is um, the Reserve Bank would like to have the dollar down at 50 to 55 because that would actually import inflation and it would actually help with the inflation targeting here locally. But I'm not sure that they have the capacity to pull the dollar down because they've basically taken interest rates to as low as they can take them. So it's really a question now of how the international markets play out. And that's going to be a function of two things. How much um, the central banks pump the um, liquidity into the system and what's going to happen with the US and with Trump and the election in November. I think if the election um, goes Trump's way, and you know some are saying it's quite likely, I think the, the, the Aussie dollar will probably be roughly where it is now, frankly. Um, if you get Biden in, you might see um, some um, change there, and that might take the dollar down. But I can't see how the um, RBA can pull our dollar lower. 
So I'm no more now of the view that because of all the liquidity that's been thrown in, it'll be you know towards where it is rather than actually down at 50 to 55. And in fact, I have seen some people suggesting it could be as high as 80 um, in the next year or two. So that's what I'm what that's what I'm thinking. Could be wrong, but uh, as with all of these things, it's just an opinion, and uh, you know, as with all opinions, they can change. This is one from uh, Dean saying, banks already stated they won't support loans indefinitely. We're already having tough conversations. Yeah, that's, it, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, we know that September is going to be a big deal and we know that uh, they will probably have to do something. They've been talking to the government about essentially um, padding the, uh, uh, the transition out over a longer period. APRA has given them plenty of wriggle room. They've basically said, yeah, you, you know, if IRB banks, in other words, the banks who run their internal risk models, um, look as though they're distorted, that's fine, just ignore it. On standard banks, don't worry, um, you know, you don't have to have mark to market. So they've been given lots of latitude there. And ASIC has said, no, no, you can change them onto different uh, lending standards and uh, interest only if you need to. So, you know, the regulators are giving everybody huge amounts of freedom. But at the end of the day, a loan is a loan is a loan. It has to be repaid at some point. So the question is, at what point do the um, banks essentially say, we have to start taking seriously what's going on? Now, of course, the risk is, with house prices probably sliding rather than growing, there's more negative equity risk. And the second is, if unemployment stays high, then default rates are going to rise. In fact, the latest data from the, ra the ratings agencies showed that defaults were rising. And I think they will continue to rise. So at some point, unless there's a massive turnaround, um, we are going to see this as a, a real big issue. And some lenders are being much more um, controlled, shall I say, than others in terms of actually what they're doing. But there are some banks who are lending big time, very happy to move people onto interest only, very happy to postpone repayments, um, hoping that things will recover later. Question is, will they? Not sure. Now, Monty13 has asked, um, thank you very much for the contribution as well, by the way. I appreciate that. Which um, Aussie banks do you think are the most sound and the least, and, and, and the least exposed? Um, well, you know, it, it's, it's always interesting because it depends what lens you use. So if you ask the question, who's got the biggest mortgage portfolios, then that's obviously Westpac and CBA. Westpac has a higher proportion of interest-only loans. Um, the other big... Two organisations, NAB and ANZ, have been essentially losing share relative to CBA and Westpac has been reducing its mortgage portfolio as well. Um, CBA has been growing its uh, portfolio, although some would say that CBA has a better underwriting process. I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but that's certainly what some people say. So it's quite hard to pick winners when it comes. To, and of course, there's very little good information other than the very high level generic stuff in the annual reports. Um, there is no dashboard in Australia, as there is in uh, New Zealand, for individual banks to be able to make comparisons between individual individual banks. In terms of Macquarie Bank, um, my own personal view of Macquarie, and um, um, it, you know, I, I've watched them for quite some time, is that they're actually pretty smart. They know what they're doing most of the time. They do make um, uh, big calls, and I think they are making calls on the property market. They've been writing quite a lot of investment loans at the moment, but they are actually pretty pretty sharp in terms of that. Um, and some of the um, foreign banks like ING are, again, quite well run. Um, I'm a bit more nervous about some of the regionals. I think that they've got bigger issues and the pressures on them to try and grow their loan books. Um, their funding costs are perhaps a little more extreme. Um, so I'm a little bit more nervous about some of them. But, you know, the point I want to make is that pretty much all the banks in Australia are directly or indirectly being supported by the Reserve Bank and by the, the government. I don't think there's much chance of a bank falling over anytime soon, <laughs> touch wood, um, simply because of the fact that the government and the Reserve Bank has proven their ability to th throw liquidity at them. And, you know, if you'd asked me that a year ago, I would have had a different view. I would have thought that they would be more on their own. But no, no, no. It seems to me that our banks are fundamentally underwritten by the government and therefore the ratings of the banks are closer to the ratings of the country than in some other countries. So I don't think there's too much concern at the moment. But there are, of course, um, always things that are never disclosed and there are always issues that probably will come to the service later. But the critical question is unemployment and property prices. If unemployment continues to rise, if prices fall, 
those are going to put pressures on pretty much every lender because every lender in Australia pretty much is really a big building society. Okay, this is a good one. Thanks, Sir Ken, for that. Um, so please write to support the Banking Amendment Deposits Bill 2020. Yeah, now this is just on this. This is the question of bail-in. So can deposit accounts be bailed in or not? In Australia, it's not totally clear. In New Zealand, it's totally clear. In New Zealand, sure, deposits can be bailed in. They can be converted to um, equity in a, in, if a bank gets into difficulty, and that allows them then to reconstruct the bank and keep the bank going which means that, um, for example, in Australia, if that happened, the deposit insurance scheme would never be triggered because the bank would never fail. So that's the thing. Here in Australia, it's much less clear. But there is this amendment uh, which has been posted and is, in fact, subject to a Senate inquiry. I put my uh, submission in earlier in the week. And um, essentially, it's quite a legal argument around to what extent the any other instrument uh, phrase refers to deposits or not. What they've tried to do with the amendment is to effectively clearly define deposits as essentially not bailable because at the moment it's very unclear. Now there's a bunch of arguments that you can throw up to say that the existing legislation is already clear but it's very unclear frankly and there are lots of people with lots of different opinions so this is a way of making it simpler. So if you um, feel strongly about it, there is a chance to have your say by making a submission. I would recommend that you make a submission formally rather than actually just throw an email because if it's an email it will just be received as a communication or a you know, correspondence and won't necessarily be counted in the um, assessment of the uh, bills. But there are a number of people putting in quite lengthy submissions including John, John Adams who's done a lot of work on this. Um, my own submission is somewhat shorter, but it makes uh, hopefully the, the points clearly. And uh, I think there is an opportunity here. If we can get that amendment in and it clearly say deposits are excluded, then the whole question of deposit bail in Australia is off the table. The problem I have is that uh, internationally speaking, the Financial Stability Board and the G20 uh, had endorsed bail in as a valid strategy for dealing with banks. So it'll be interesting to see whether, in fact, um, uh, our government uh, allows this to go through or whether they actually try to stop it. If they stop it, if they put up arguments to say it does not require it or you know, it might be some other, other argument, then I'd get a bit more nervous about the bail-in situation. But as I said earlier on, I have to say that the liquidity of banks is pretty much secured now by the Reserve Bank and what they're doing. So I'm not as concerned as I was a year or two ago. And I've still got money in the banks at the moment. Uh, on the principle that um, it's better to have money in the system rather than outside of it. Others will disagree, but that's my own that's my own strategy and my own view. Right. What else have we got? Oh, so many questions. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to do another postcode. Um, let me just put this one in. So this uh, Bob asked me uh, earlier on for to do a uh, postcode. I'm just going to put this one in. Let's clear the list. We'll put a 2710 in. Hope I've got this right. Okay, and get that one there. Apply. Okay, yeah. All right, so let's go across to the... Uh, this is 2710, which includes um, Coldwell and uh, some other places that I find it difficult to pronounce, so I won't even try. Wakul, possibly, 2710. Anyway, there are 5,000 households there, of which 1,500 are borrowing, and 2,260 are renting. There are 1,754 properties for rent. There are around 1,000 property owners living in the area. 215 have mild mortgage stress of those with a mortgage. No severe, 14.3% in mortgage stress. The risk of default... Um, over the next 12 months is 26, it's quite low, 1.7%. The rental stress, 884 of those renting are in difficulty at 39.1%, so that's a little bit below the national average. The stressed investors, 133, um, of which 33 are severely stressed, so that gives you a 15.4% uh, rating for investors in that postcode who are stressed. So relatively speaking, that's actually pretty good 
relative to many other postcodes. So not too much to see there in my view, which is uh, perhaps good. Um, I just want to go down and um, acknowledge uh, Reverse French for his contribution. Thank you very much for that. I really appreciate uh, you, your support for what we do. Death and Regret, thank you very much. And your question is, do you think, do I think gold is money? Well, medium exchange, store of value, et cetera, et cetera. It pretty much has some... Um, quite a few of the attributes of money. The point, of course, is it's quite hard to uh, necessarily convert it right easily. So fungibility is my, my key question. Um, fungibility means, you know, can I convert it to um, buy f f for fish and chips? If you take a gold bar, it's going to be hard to convert. So that's the one issue I've got. And the big question I have with gold is that um, if you hold gold, you know, and you hold it, you know, in your house you've got to store it somewhere and then you've got to convert it if you want to use it so it's not got all the characteristics of money on the other hand and there are many people who would argue that it's a more stable foundation of a currency than the um the, the you know the, the false currencies we have at the moment uh, where effectively central banks can blow up the value um and as you know i've made the point several times that there's a big debate about whether inflation or deflation is going to be the story of the day into the future if inflation is going to be the way then gold potentially is a protection against inflation um, in other words the devaluation of our sort of paper money as it were um, fiat money if you think deflation is the story of the day then maybe gold won't be such a good value holder and in a way that's difficult to know whether we're going to get inflation or deflation different people have different points of view uh, i interviewed the other day somebody from the us who's a very good macro economist and analyst and his view was deflation first and then inflation later. So interesting. So, yeah, so my view, it's got some of the attributes of uh, money, but not necessarily all of them. OK. Um, and Michael asked, great show, Martin. Thank you. Um, and thanks for your contribution. How long can banks hold up before enforcing sales on those who can't make payments? Um, is there any outdated out there? Well, what's interesting about that is that if you look at what happened in the global financial crisis in the US, banks held off foreclosing for years because they didn't want to flood the market with lots of properties into a falling market. So there were lots of people who effectively ended up paying no mortgage for quite a long time. And banks ultimately ended up selling on those properties at a deep discount to somebody else to hold them. So I wouldn't be surprised to see asset sales. In other words, distress loans and properties being sold to other entities, hedge funds, those sorts of things. Um, once that happens, hedge funds are much more aggressive in terms of their foreclosure routines. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I think that we're going to see this just run for perhaps six to 12 months. Um, we'll see mortgage stress can still rising. We'll see probably more defaults, but not massive defaults. But if unemployment stays high, ultimately it's going to you know, it's going to get into a situation where banks are going to have to start foreclosing. And there's a very significant PR question about foreclosure, which is one reason why they prefer to sell the assets onto somebody else rather than be seen to foreclosing in their own right. Um, the other point to make is, of course, that um, if you a securitized pool, um, a lender has the opportunity of swapping out a bad loan for, and a bad property, as it were, for another one. So expect to see some jiggery pokery in the securitization pools to maintain the security in those pools as well. Haven't seen much of that yet, but um, APRA, in fact, came out today with a change to the FAQs to cover just that scenario, which means that they're thinking about it. OK, now let's have a bit of a go here. Um, postcodes, um, SS Tech, let's see if I can do that one. Um, 3082 and 3076. Let me just try and put that in for you. I know this is very exciting um, TV, isn't it, when you're watching me clear my list and put some new postcodes in, but uh, th there isn't a quick way of doing this. Um, 3082, we'll add that one, and then we'll add 3076, 3076, we'll add that one too. Okay, and then we'll apply, make sure it comes up. Yep. OK, let's go across to the old screen. There you go. So this is um, Epping and Mill Park in Victoria. So 3076, 11,000 households, 6,000 borrowing, 4,000 renting, 3,200 properties for rent, 
uh, rental property owners are just over 3,000. Mild mortgage stress, 3,888, which is 64.6%. So that's very high, much higher than in Mill Park, as we'll see in a second. Risk of default, 115 at 1 1.9. So that's not too bad. Anything below two is probably reasonable at the moment. Um, rental stress, 2,282, which is 52.9% of uh, those renting in difficulty. So that's above the average. Um, stressed investors, 525, of which 75 are severely stressed. And that's 19.7. So many probably investors in that area are OK. Few aren't. But I'd be looking at the mortgage stress data as the critical point. So clearly there are people there with difficulties. Um, that probably is enough to put price pressure on the area. Now, in terms of Mill Park, 10,000 um, households there, 5,000 borrowing. So roughly similar ratios, 3,100 renting, 2,400 properties for rent. <coughs> the number of rental property owners, just over 3,000. Mild mortgage stress, 1,926. No severe stress, 38.1%. So compared with 64.6, mortgage stress in that adjacent postcode is much lower. Risk of default, 1.7. That's slightly lower. Rental stress, 1,982, which is at 62.1%. So slightly higher than the previous one. And stressed investors, 453, of which 76 are severely stressed. And that means that the percentage of investors who are stressed is 17.1%. So not huge, but significant. So I hope that's um, helped you with that one. Whoops, let's go back to the main camera. Um, my M, thank you very much for your contribution. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> John says, buy Martin a coffee, you miserable cheatskates. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate that. Um, uh, Vanessa says, um, good evening, Martin. We love your work. Do you have an update on the 10k cash limit and any thoughts on the banks limiting cash withdrawals? And thank you for your contribution, Vanessa. Um, yeah, so two things to say. There is no progress at all in terms of any news from the um, uh, uh, in incumbent government with regard to any change to the fact that they were asked to, to go do more work on the cash ban following the Senate inquiry. They've done nothing. And uh, the hypothesis that we're running with at the moment is that they are choosing to do nothing rather than uh, just uh, too busy to do nothing. And uh, therefore, the chances are that the, um, the cash bank thing will probably um, uh, you know, dissipate. But, of course, since COVID, more businesses are now essentially um, are going for the non-cash route. And, of course, many banks have been mailing debit cards to people so that they can use them instead of cash. So there is a, a, a move afoot to effectively replace cash with electronic through a different mechanism. But in a way, I'm less concerned about that insofar that um, if it's a choice between the two, that's fine, because, of course, the cash ban was going to effectively take away a civil liberty that we had to settle in cash if we wanted to. And at the moment, there's no evidence of that actually happening. So my own view is I think that um, we'll continue to watch it but it's unlikely that we're going to see the cash ban come in in its current form. And uh, the amount of work they'd have to do to recraft it would mean it's probably um, off the agenda for some time. They probably will never actually come back and formally declare it a closed issue. They'll just keep it quiet, you know, a typical Sir Humphrey, and just um, you know, carry on with those other stuff. So that's my, that's my read on, on the situation there. Um, now, Monty13 says... Which Aussie banks do you think are the most sound and least exposed? I think I answered that earlier on, didn't I? So I won't do that. Um, AI, thank you very much for that contribution. Appreciate that. And MP, um, thank you for that too. Given China's extremely high debt levels, are you expecting a major banking or currency crisis there? If so, when? <laughs> well, the thing about China is it's hard to know quite what's going on, right? Disclosure is quite low. What I will say is that we know that they've been reducing the capital ratios for the banks up in China. And we know that the debts are very high in China. Now, because the system there is really centrally controlled and centrally managed, um, they keep, um, you know, when a bank falls over, they just get it uh, amalgamated or otherwise um, changed and then it continues. So in a way, you know, it's probably not the same as a Western banking crisis. Um, I suspect 
that it'll go on for quite some time. I expect they'll throw more liquidity at it. I expect they will reduce capital further. Um, you know, the Chinese economy is beginning to turn around. Um, the COVID is under control there at the moment. And uh, it may well be that, in fact, the, uh, the worst of the crisis is past. So uh, it's not, you know, necessary that there will be a crisis. They're also um, holding liquidity more than previously. So they're stopping people from shipping money overseas. And they want people to bring money back to China. And that's providing more liquidity locally too as well. So all of those factors suggest to me that the risks are somewhat lower than many people think. But, uh, you know, as all of these things, the transparency is not uh, that great. OK, what else have we got? Uh, I thought some more postcodes there, which I'll do in a moment. Um, this is a very interesting comment from Jess. Afterpay doesn't solve over indebted population. Yeah, that's very true. Afterpay is a very interesting phenomenon insofar that it doesn't create new credit, it just basically makes people use their existing credit facilities um, more, or indeed, if they use a debit card, then they have to pay, um, you know, in, in full. Um, uh, sequences uh, to be able to actually pay it off. And um, around 25% of people who've used Afterpay end up paying fees, quite big fees. And that's something which a lot of people are not fully aware of. So it seems like it's it's a home run. It seems like it's you know a way of spreading out your payments. Um, but there are huge risks. And unfortunately, quite a few people who have Afterpay facilities also have credit cards and have other debt mechanisms too. So in a way, it's just a debt extension strategy. And the problem I have with all this debt extension is it just makes the problem worse and worse. And of course, debt is wired into the way the society works. And debt is wired into the way that people are expected to behave. You know, it's a consumer society. You use your credit card or you use Afterpay to buy what you want and worry about paying it off later. The trouble is that the music ultimately probably is going to stop. And um, interestingly, uh, I did a show um, a few days ago with um, uh, with Steve, um, who, who actually uh, you know is one of the experts in credit cards, for example, and he made the point that interest rates on credit cards are higher than they were. Um, <clears throat> so that's from CanStar, I should say. Um, so, you know, you can pay a lot and um, Afterpay is a way of paying less if you pay it off. But if you don't pay it off, then you end up paying a lot more. So it's a big deal. And uh, I personally am quite sceptical of those systems. I know that they've had a huge run on the stock market. I think they need more regulation personally, but I don't think that'll happen because the regulators are, again, asleep at the wheel. OK, that's his one. Let's do this one. So Michael says... Cough Harbour, 2450. OK, I'll try and put that in for you. Uh, clear the list. 2450, OK. Apply. Oh dear, what happened there? Right. Need to hum up my my skills, don't I? Um, let's get rid of that so you can see the answer. Okay, two four five zero. So this is Coff Har Coffs Harbour in the area around there. Nineteen thousand people uh, borrow households. Six thousand borrowing. Eight thousand renting. Six thousand five hundred properties for renting. The number of rental property owners at five thousand five hundred. Mild stress one thousand one hundred eighty five. Severe stress two to four making. Mortgage stress, 22.9%. Risk of default, 191. Default over the next 12 months, 2.9%. So a little higher than some, but no, not massive. Rental stress, 5,859 at 67.9%. So that's quite high. That would suggest that a number of people are going to actually um, potentially be in some difficulty. And... Um, uh, stressed investors, 1,721, of which severe stress, 379, making 38.1% of investors stressed. So the thing to look at there, in my view, would be the um, the rental stress, which at 67.9% is quite concerning. That would suggest that quite a few people are beginning to struggle with making those repayments at the moment on their rents. And um, mortgage stress itself is not uh, not too bad. It's below the national average. Okay, so let's go back to there. 
another postcode 4127 I wonder what that is I haven't quite memorized every postcode across Australia yet although I'm getting there as I do more of this um, of course there are quite a few I should explain that the, the analysis is done at a postcode level not a, um, a, a level below that simply because there has to be some um, degree of managing the the whole process okay so uh, Natalie um, this is yours there you go um, so Daisy Hill 4127 10,000 households of which 4,500 are borrowing 4,280 are renting there are 3,260 properties for rent there are 2,100 rental property owners 3,400 in mild mortgage stress no severe stress that is those 76.7 percent of mortgage of people in mortgage with mortgages in stress so that mortgage stress is very high risk of default um, quite low 106 but 2.3 percent and rental stress 383 8.9 so not too much rental stress there mortgage stress is the real story um, that would suggest more pressure on prices ahead I would, I would have thought um, stressed investors pretty low at 281 which is 13.3 percent so there you go I would suggest that quite a few of those investors are not holding property in that particular area but elsewhere which is often what we find um, it's quite interesting looking at the relationship between where people live and where they invest and quite often they're investing in different locations um, so there you go what else have we got another one here we go Pradeep three Oh eight seven. Okay. Three oh eight seven. Clear the list. Three oh eight seven. And that apply. Okay, here we go. And better kill that so you can see it, eh? There you go. Um so that's at what's on here? Um 387 300 and, sorry 3724 households 1649 borrowing 1170 renting 885 properties for rent number of rental property owners 497 mild stress 1531 percentage in default this is pretty big 92.8% so a lot of people in difficulty default risk 33 or 2% over the next 12 months rental stress 252 which is 30 percent and uh, stressed investors only 6.6 .6. so the critical issue there is mortgage stress uh, a lot of people on the outer suburbs of victoria and we see that again and again and again in and around victoria as i showed you earlier on quite a few of the postcodes in and around victoria are hugely stressed the property sector in victoria is the thing i'm most concerned about of all the states um, I think Victoria and New, around around Melbourne in particular is is going to definitely be uh, under pressure ahead. I think. <laughs> okay, um, Dean, did I do that one? Two oh nine five. No, I didn't. Okay, let me just see if I can get that up on the screen. Um, okay, we'll do it that way. Right. Dean, thank you for that. I appreciate the contribution. It really is very helpful. Um, and I've explained before, I don't make profit from this uh, exercise. Um, it's all about um, just helping to cover the costs of what we do. Um, believe it or not, there are quite a lot of costs involved in creating DFA and creating all the content. Uh, content. Um, and uh, sometimes... Um, a bit of extra finance makes a huge difference to what we can do. All right, so Dean, this is Manly. Okay, this is 295, 8,478 households, of which 1,000 are going to do a borrowing, 5,459 are renting. There's 4,133 rental properties, 3,016 in mild stress, none severe stress, and that makes a 56.7%. Hang on. Play that again. 
Number in rental property owners, 3,016. Mild stress, nothing. Severe stress, 948. So quite a few people are in difficulty, cash flow wise. 56.7% um, of people in that postcode in mortgage stress. Risk of default, this is quite high, 5.9% or 99. And rental stress, 1,950, which is 35.7%. Stressed investors, 1,334. Severe stressed, 290. And that's 53.8%. So you can see there that uh, mortgage stress is significant, 56. That's above 50. Anything above 50 is very concerning. Expect prices to fall. And uh, particularly when property investors who are living in that particular area are also 53.8% under pressure too. So I think that will probably be my conclusion. Um, manly prices will slide. Okay, what else have we got? Um, let's do that one there. Litter. I like the doggy picture, very good. Um, 2912. As you may know, we have dogs, so react very positively to doggy pictures. <laughs> okay. 2912. Yeah, let's get rid of that. And then go to there. There we go. So this is uh, Gunhainen in regional uh, around the ACT. 2,336 households, 862 borrowing, 1,427 renting, 1,068 properties for rent. Number of rental property owners, 725. Mild stress, 96. No severe stress, so 11.1% of mortgage stress. Risk of default, 10, 1.2%, so that's below the average. Rental stress, 204. 14.3% uh, in rental stress, so that's quite low. And stressed investors, 250 which is 34.5%, which is, you know, a little bit a little bit above the 25% average, but um, not not too bad. So my read of that is that um, probably investors probably are the ones to watch there. Many of them will be perhaps owning properties elsewhere. But so far as mortgage stress is concerned, it looks pretty good. Rental stress, not really too much of an issue at the moment with, with, that, with that sort of size of um, number coming through. So there you go. That's that one. Okay, Robert, 4114, 4114, take that, apply, okay, so that's Woodridge in, um, Queensland, 10,950 households, 2,719 borrowing, 7,225 renting, a lot of renters, of 5,379 rental properties. Um, the number of rental property owners, 3,433. Mild stress, 1,020, which is 37.5%. Risk of default, 60 over the next year at 2.2%. So rental stress, 2,210 at 30.6%, so that's a bit below the national average. Stressed investors, 1,164, of which 116 are severely stressed, and that's 37.3% of investors. So really, um, you know, mortgage stress, little, little around the average, maybe slightly lower. Um, investor stress, a little higher. But um, not as severe as some of the postcodes that I've seen. All right. What else we've got? Three, 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 five. Clear list. Three, 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 five. Apply. Come on, apply. Okay. All right. This is Plumpton in Victoria, um, including Rock Bank in a regional Australia. 
3335. So 2,193 households, of which 1,553 are borrowing, 719 are renting. Um, properties for rent, 538. Number of rental property owners, 325. Mild stress, 725, which is 46.7% in mortgage stress 37 risk default 12 months percentage risk of default 2.4 percent rental stress 431 at 59.9 percent 36 percent 36 stressed investors at 11.1 so the question there of course is mortgage stress which is um, pretty bad and rental stress so we're also a relatively small postcode and uh, you know you could argue that it's a relatively small count those proportions are quite significant and I'm seeing this number of regional postcodes across the country that whilst the big numbers are close into a lot of the major centres some of the smaller ones are looking pretty um, pretty difficult as well okay here's one new vision printing I'm going to do that Two seven six zero. Add that. Apply. Okay, this is uh, Collison. I think that's how you pronounce it. Could be wrong. This is uh, Oxley Park, St Mary's, New South Wales. Twelve thousand seven hundred eighty-two households. 5,179 borrowing, 6,534 renting, 4,902 properties for rent, 4,994 rental property owners, 3,747 mild mortgage stress, none in severe stress, 72.3% in mortgage stress, 77 risking default at 1.5%, 5,208 in rental stress at 79.7, so that's a big number. Rental stress is your problem, I think, there. 1,488 stressed investors, of which severe stress, 926. And investors that are stressed, 48.3%. So investors renting rather than mortgage stress, perhaps, is the... Uh, sorry, investing is also significant. Mortgage stress, of course, there, though, 72.3% is, the is the big deal. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Peach One, for your uh, contributions. Very much appreciate it. Um, and uh, um, I've got one here. Love your work. Can you please show us data for 2263, the Central Coast? Yes, I'll do that one, and then I'm just going to move on to the rest of my presentation. Uh, clear list. Okay. 2263, 2263. Okay, well, add that, apply it, okay. Two two six three, which is Noraville, it includes some of these other areas too, including Nora Head. Uh, Eleven thousand two hundred and thirty nine households, three thousand four hundred and fourteen borrowing, five thousand two hundred and forty nine renting, four thousand and thirty six for rent. Number of rental property owners, 4,308. Mild stress, 1,295. No severe stress at 37.9%. 100 risking default in the next 12 months, 2.9% over the next 12 months. Rental stress, 2,566 at 48.9%, so quite a lot of rental stress. And stressed investors, 1,400, of which 287 are severely stressed, and that's 39.2%. So as I see in quite a few of the central coast areas, um, there are high levels of stress and it's uh, touching mortgage stress, rental stress and investor stress differently in different postcodes. But it's certainly an area to watch in my view. OK. Now, what I want to do is just to go back to there. OK, I'm just going to... Um, go back to my presentation and just go through the light we're coming up to 9 30. i'll still do a few more postcodes a bit later but i'll just do this just in terms of if you want more information about what we do the dfa blog is available 
and contains a lot of information all of our posts go up there a lot of other information goes up there as well you can subscribe there's a thing saying subscribe to the DFA blog if you do that you then get alerts every time we post um, so that might be something you want to do um, it's free so there's no cost involved in doing that you can also support our work via Patreon. I just wanted to highlight this in a bit more detail because we've done some enhancements to Patreon. Firstly, it's worth highlighting they now um, are obliged to charge GST, so that's actually um, made some changes to, to, to that. But we have five tiers now, um, a basic support, $3 US a month um, just to help us out, or a bit more, $10 a month, where you actually get access to some additional content and early research. Or $25 a month, which I call DFA Plus, where you can do um, more to support us, but also get more access to, for example, some of my other interviews. Some, when I record TV interviews, I will often uh, record the um, the whole interview and put it up there so that people can actually um, um, see it. Uh, you might only get you know, a, a minute on the TV, but you might get a 10 minutes of interview from me. So that's uh, so one of the things that I do. And then I've got... Um, DFA stress at fifty dollars a month. If you want the full stress data set for all two thousand postcodes across the country, you can subscribe via Patreon, and they'll get mailed to you. Um, pretty much, in fact, I sent them out yesterday f uh, for uh, a number of patrons who actually have already subscribed. So that gives you all of the data in my data set that you saw tonight for every postcode in the land. And uh, if you want to sort of track what's going on, that's probably the best tool, $50 a month. This is all US dollars, I should say. And then the, if you really want to go the whole hog, at $500 a month, you can also subscribe to receive my full data set each month, more than 120 fields of data by 52,000 house uh, postcodes. Um, for a full year, each month 4,700. So you get basically a monthly drop of 4,700 households for you doing your own modeling and comparisons and all those sorts of things. So those are the things we offer via Patreon. And we have um, a healthy number of Patreon subscribers and supporters, but always room for more. And it is probably, you know, a bit of a set and forget way of doing it, but it really is a very powerful way of supporting what we do. So consider that. On the other hand, if you want to make a one off donation, um, you can do it via PayPal. And uh, there's uh, details there, PayPal me, Martin DFA. Um, that's a great way people occasionally do that too. So thank you for that. Or even Bitcoin. If you want to use Bitcoin, there's a QR code there that um, you can use. And um, I've had very small bits of Bitcoin from a few people. But uh, uh, a lot of people said, you must do Bitcoin. So I did. And well, you know, I've got a few, but not a lot. So there you go. Um, in terms of uh, merch, uh, there is this DFA Des Design Intelligent Insight today, which I've got um, plastered on mugs and shirts and bits and pieces. So if you're interested in that, you can go to the um, the store there. It's also available direct from the YouTube channel as well. I had a few people um, uh, essentially use that. And, uh, you know, a, a, a nice slice of the um, profit um, goes back to me to help. Um, but obviously, the the bulk of it is on the production of the articles but we do we do actually make a, a little from those if you use that so that's another way of supporting us if you'd like a dfa mug they're not cheap i have to say but that's because of the um way that teespring works um i couldn't do it for any less so it's not i'm not making massive profits but i am making just a, a dollar or two on each one um in terms of topics this month um steve mickenbecker uh that's from canstar it's worth watching that show if you've got a credit card because we talk about how you can save some money on credit cards and in the current environment i think that's pretty important i did an interview with brian martin an emeritus professor talking about what's really going on with things like um, royal commissions and uh, some of the other things that are actually there in other words the process that you think are going on but regulation aren't necessarily the process that's going on. Recommend that. Um, had fun with that. Tony did a, another show quite recently. Um, Tony's always great fun and uh, calls it like it is. If you've not caught up with his show, do watch that. And um, uh, Steve Van Meter from the US, the Marcus of Disconnect from Reality, that's the guy I mentioned earlier on about macro 
Um, he's really, really good, I think. And we'll do some more shows with him on um, what's going on in the US because he's got a really good handle, I think, on some of the critical issues. Uh, and particularly, as I said, he's deflation rather than inflation orientated. And then just on the other channel, if you want more information about that submission for Friday, the submissions close on Friday relating to the amendments to the bail-in legislation, um, go across to the Walk the World channel and look out the post. Coalition MP lets the cat out of the bag on bail-in. Uh, that's basically John Adams and myself talking specifically about the legislation and the change. And uh, there are links there to be able to go across to make a submission uh, if, you, if you're so inclined. It's an important issue, as I discussed earlier on. And uh, if you've got time, um, it doesn't have to be a long submission, but make a submission. It needs to be in by Friday um, because there's a chance we can kill deposit bail in dead if we can get this uh, change to the law passed. OK. Um, now, the only other thing I just want to mention is that uh, next week um, I have a live Q&A session with Veronica Morgan, who's um, property realist is what she calls herself. Um, I would say she's uh, much more bullish on property than I am. But um, I've had a number of people say uh, over the year, over the years, why don't you try and get somebody who's more um, property positive on well, Veronica is more probably positive, but she's also very much a realist, I think, and actually makes some really good points. So she'll be on next week for a, a Q&A session. Uh, so you can ask her whatever you like about buying property, selling property. Uh, you can ask her about uh, location, location, location. You can ask her about um, her property academy and some of the books that she's written. So I think that'll be um, a fun show. That's, that's uh, 8 p.m. Uh, next Tuesday. So mark that in your diaries and um, we'll put the uh, link up in the next day or two for that and again if you've got questions ahead i'm very happy to um uh you know record those ahead of time or uh, as normal on the live stream so that's pretty much that um again uh, hopefully a recommended and useful show another question to ask you is um do you like the live q a with other people on like you know we've had tony on we've had um uh uh, we had uh, the the nucleus wealth guy on last week, um, and we've had a few others too. Um, I'm just trying to get a sense of um, what the mix between me talking and presenting my data versus me having an informal chat with other people. Be interested to get your feedback. So tell me what you think. Um, do you want more? Do you want less? Who would like to come? Who would, who would you like for me to come get come back on? And are there other people you'd like me to have a conversation with live? Um, always happy to take uh, thoughts and recommendations on that. Okay, so with that there, um, I must tell you that I um, haven't got much chance to do a lot more postcodes, but I will do just a couple more. Uh, and I will then give you a clue as to how to get the data if you haven't had it today. I know that there are lots of people who asked and I haven't been able to process them. It's just um, the fact of the matter is I've only got one pair of hands and I've only got a limited amount of time that I can spend on this. But uh, nevertheless, I'm doing Anthony's 3220. Okay, apply. Okay, so this is um, both in Victoria. Heighten and Newton, Greater Geelong. So Heighton, 23,345, so that's a large number. 9,792 borrowing, 8,624 renting, 6,508 properties for rent, and 7,935 rental property owners. 3,775 in smile stress at 38.6%, so, you know, around average. 281 risking default, or 2.9%, so that's slightly higher than some, but not dramatic. Rental stress, 4,079 at 47.3, so that's a little higher. So it looks to me as though there are some signs of stress there. And stressed investors, 1,913, of which severe stress, 345, and 28.5% of investors stressed. And then if we go to Geelong and Newton, or is it Newton or Newtown? I don't know which way it's pronounced. 7,843 households, of which 2,400... As you were. As you were. I'll do that again. Sorry. Apologies. 
23,345 households, 9,792 borrowing, 8,624 renting, 6,508 properties for rent, 7,935 rental property owners, and 3,775 in mild mortgage stress. 38.6% of those in mortgage stress, so, you know, about average. 281 risking default, 2.9%. 4,079 rental stress, 47.3% in rental stress. 1,913 stressed investors, of which 345 are severe stressed, making 28.5% of investors stressed. And then the other one, this is um, Geelong, 7,000. 843, um, that's the number of households. Borrowing, 2,453, 3,797. Uh, renting, 2,898 properties for rent, 1,512 uh, in rental property owners, 2,000 in mild stress, none in severe stress but a high number 81.8 percent in mild mortgage stress so cash flows big cash flow issues there 55 risking default at 2.2 percent 2109 in rental stress at 55.5 percent so again rentals also quite high 492 stressed investors none severely stressed at 32.5 percent so there we are okay well I think I am pretty much done. Um, I want to just say thank you very much for spending your spending some time with me on the show tonight. For those who have not been able to get the postcode information they wanted, there is an alternative route that you can use, and that is if you send me um, your postcode directly via the DFA blog using the message facility and um, just ask for the postcode, I will, over the next couple of days, pull out the information and email it back to you. So that's um, a commitment that I can I can make. And if you've got you know two or three, I'm happy to do two or three. If it gets a too long a list, then um, it's probably not going to happen because it's just going to be too difficult. But um, um, nevertheless, um, I think it's quite uh, important that people get a feel for what's happening. I'll update the stress data again next month, and when I'm on again in a couple of weeks. I'll also have the database online again then as well, so we can potentially spend a bit more time on that. But, um, you know, I don't want to spend every show going through postcodes because otherwise uh, we won't be able to cover some of the other things I want to cover. But anyway, I think it's quite important. And I want to make two final points. The first is if you are in financial difficulty, mortgage stress or rental stress, and, um, you know, are wrestling with this, there are things that you can do. The first one, is, of course, is to drop a cash flow so you can see where the money is coming in and where it's going. Um, then do some prioritizing. And uh, quite often, you know, I find when I survey households, they have very little idea of where the money is going. So that's the first thing. Understand where the money is going. The second is if you've got a mortgage, um, banks are an obligation to assist. So go talk to them early, particularly now with the various facilities and opportunities there are to defer payments and things. Um, if you are feeling the pressure, mortgage pressure particularly, go talk to them. If you've got rental stress, um, you know, the, the fact is that the current arrangements are that your landlord should be amenable to a discussion about it. Um, now, I say should be because many aren't, but that's the official position. Um, so it's worth thinking about that, too. And um, if you are a property investor who is um, under some pressure at the moment, join the 13 percent of property investors who, in my surveys, are now saying they're looking to sell because they can't make the economics work anymore. And that is actually quite a significant commentary, I think, on the way things are. So that's some um, um, the, just the, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter, I'm afraid. Um, we are in a difficult situation. I think that mortgage stress, rental stress and investor stress will get worse. I think prices will slide further. And unfortunately, with the COVID rearranging itself and you know emerging in different locations, um, let's hope Victoria sorts it out. If you're locked down in Victoria, um, you know, sorry to hear about that. Um, hang in there. Um, we can get through it, of course. But um, the f concern I would have is that if it spreads more widely, then of course it gets more serious. And uh, unfortunately, there is no simple way to solve it. We have to get the health issues controlled before we can get the economy to fire again. And unfortunately, the more that the health issues run on, the less 
the economy will bounce back. All right, last look at the comment tree. What else have I got? Got everything there. Um, Plexus has posted the blog. Thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> all right, Amber. I'll do one more. All right, just for you. How about that? <laughs> I know I'm nuts. Okay. Four seven four zero. Oh. Apply. Okay. So that's Mount Pleasant. So let's get rid of that. Go across to there. Okay, last one for the night. Mount Pleasant, Mackay, 35,509 households, 13,350 borrowing, 17,575 renting, 13,271 for rent, number of rental property owners, 7,245, mild stress, 5,528, no severe stress, 41.4%. So it's quite high. It's above the national average. 386 risking default at 2.9, so that's a little, little higher than some. 2,600 in terms of rental stress, 14.8%, not too bad. Stressed investors, 803, of which 73 are severely stressed, and that's 12.1%. So it doesn't look too bad to me, but uh, I'd be worried about that mortgage stress. And uh, I'm seeing quite a few places up in Queensland um, with significant rises in stress because of the uh, financial pressures relating to COVID and all those things from there. OK, well, I want to say thank you very much for your spending time with me to um, tonight. Um, you know, as with always, I've not been able to cover all of the com conversations or indeed all, all of the comments, uh, but hopefully that's been quite useful. Um, we got um, a peak concurrent of uh, eight, 880, I think. Yeah, pretty much that. 880, that's pretty good. So thank you very much for that. I look forward to seeing you next week. There will be some more shows coming out in the next few days. I've got some more interviews planned. Um, a couple of quite famous people will be on, hopefully, if I can, uh, can swing it. Um, I won't mention them by name in case I embarrass them later. But um, we've got some more interviews coming. We've got some more content of course as well from our other analysis so i look forward to seeing you there thank you very much for your time tonight take care keep safe keep well and uh, we'll see you next time this is martin north from digital finance analytics signing off bye